so it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Nicholas Hartlett. Uh, Dr. Hartlett is the Robert Charles Billings Chair in Education at Berea College, where he chairs the Department of Education Studies. Before he arrived at Berea, Dr. Hartlett chaired the Department of Early Childhood and Elementary Education at Metropolitan State University, an Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institution in St. Paul, Minnesota. He also serves as the Graduate Program Coordinator there. Dr. Hartlett has published dozens of articles and authored or edited an incredible 22 books including the work that is at the center of our conversation today, racial battle fatigue and faculty perspectives and lessons from higher education. While I've known of and cited his work for years, particularly his analyses of the model minority racism against Asian Americans and understanding neoliberalism's impact on educational foundations as a field, I first met Dr. Hartland at our big national conference, the American Educational Research Association, where we were introduced by an editor with SUNY Press. Later, we met again when his book, the Neoliberal Agenda and the Student Debt Crisis in U.S. Higher Education, and my own, uh, were both honored as part of the Outstanding Book Award by the Society of Professors of Education back in 2018. Dr. Hartlett was generous and gifted me with a copy of his book, and we've kept in touch ever since. He's contributed on the Encyclopedia Project on Critical Whiteness Studies in Education that I'm currently editing, and I'm very, very thrilled that he's here with us. Um, Dr. Hartlett reached out to me back in 2019 about opportunities to present on this book, um, and at that point is when I suggested to him and to Amy um, that we could learn a great deal about our ongoing struggles to recruit and retain faculty of color with and from him. Um, and so I'm very, very excited that we're now having that opportunity. He's been working with, we had a session with junior faculty, we had a session with senior faculty, uh, sort of a, an affinity caucus that seems like maybe wasn't as well attended as we wish it would have been this afternoon. Um, but I'll also plug, uh, there's a chance to come back and engage a little bit more with kind of a wider community. Students were invited, uh, invited staff were invited for a lunch session tomorrow at noon. Um, I think it's not too late, so let April know if you want to come with that. So, there's, there's also a coffee at 11, if you'd like to just pop it all back in this room. So uh, with that, I'll get out of the way. Please help me welcome Dr. Nicholas Hartman. All right, let's get this started. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank President Haas, Sherry Turner, of course, Zach, Casey, Amy, Jasperson, and Academic Affairs for bringing me here. Um, you know, I'll be honest, um, I write so much because you can revise and rewrite your words. But once you speak, right, you can, you know, stammer and stutter and not be articulate. And so I'm going to read from the book, um, The Afterword, which was written by Noel Arnold. Um, associate Dean at Ohio State University. A little bit about the book. Um, Daisy Ball, my co-editor and I, we've, we've written several books and edited several projects together. And she's a white uh, sociologist, criminologist um, at Roanoke College now. And so you might ask yourself, well, why, why is she editing a book on racial battle fatigue as a, as a woman? Well, you have to buy the book and read it the, the beginning <laughs> for that answer. But um, she's a very good um, writer and editor, and um, she's not here, but I'd, I'd like to thank Daisy um, for her partnership. All right. So, so I begin with just a quote. If you were in the discussion earlier, I, I put the same quote up, but it's from Paulo Freire, and he says in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, it is not our role to speak to the people about our own view of the world, nor to attempt to impose that view on them, but rather to dialogue with the people about their views, experiences, and ours. And I guess that was on my heart and my head as I was preparing um, today's session with you all, because um, as I've gotten older, I'm young, but as I've you know, gotten older, um, my um, attitude and positionality has evolved over time. Um, there was a time, um, even five years ago, which I would probably just say, um, curse them all, they don't understand it, they have no desire, uh, and that's softened quite a bit. We come into this space, with our own biographies and experiences. And so I hope to engage in a dialogue with you all around the topic of racial battle fatigue in um, faculty, which you all are. Um, however, from the lens of administrators as department chairs, um, 
to use Zach's words as comrades, because um, I, I too am a department chair. So it's with that spirit I'd like to, to start. Um, so the book um, is an edited volume of counter stories written by faculty members who work at various institution types, community colleges, minority serving institutions, um, primarily white institutions, institutions that focus mostly on teaching, institutions that focus mostly on research. And it was very intentional for me to have Noel pen the afterword. And I told her explicitly, please Noel, write it from an administrator as an associate dean, because this book is written for department chairs. Um, it's written for hiring authorities, presidents, provosts, academic affairs, student affairs with the sole um, goal to share these counter stories, but then also share the um, strategies. What can we do? You know, the, 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 the actionable strategies. Um, so what we discovered was the chapters had similarities and that's what this figure is, this framework of racial battle fatigue as we're sharing it here. Um, higher ed has white epistemology, Faculty of color experience microaggressions. Faculty of color certainly have hiring experiences and those hiring experiences tend to be very dehumanizing and racist. Um, faculty of color at times don't feel as though they belong on the campuses. Notice that's across the board. So it's not simply at primarily historically white institutions. That could even be at minority serving institutions, right? Uh, and lastly, faculty of color at times feel invisible and or ignored. And that is something as um, department chairs should really resonate with you, or not resonate with you, rather you should think about um, in terms of how you lead your department. Um, and then lastly, the, the, the Zora um, Neil Hurston quote to the right, if you're silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. The notion of counter storytelling um, is important because we don't want the dialogue to be silent. So I'd, I'd like to read, um, and these are words of Dr. Arnold, who did a remarkable job on the, the afterward, but it really encapsulates the book um, quite well. And then my plan is to pose some questions that you can um, discuss at your table groups. <coughs> Okay, so you might think, well, what, what is racial battle fatigue, right? Smith, Allen, and Danley in 2007 described racial battle fatigue as social psychological stress responses. Ergo, frustration, anger, exhaustion, physical avoidance, psychological or emotional withdrawal, escapism, acceptance of racist attributions associated with being a person of color and the repeated target of racism. The cumulative encumbrance and consequences of racism can result in public health and um, mental illness. Racial battle fatigue can manifest itself broadly in physical symptoms by increasing a stress-induced um, body response state, resulting in weakened immunity and increased sickness, tension headaches, trembling and jumpiness, chronic pain and healed injuries, elevated blood pressure, and a pounding heartbeat. Um, earlier I talked about paranoia, that, that also can be manifested. The racism that non-white faculty experience literally makes them sick. Presidents, provosts, deans, and department chairs need to reduce the racial battle fatigue that their non-white faculty experience. Fagan in 2010 and 2013 states that inclinations to discriminatory action make up the white racial frame which in turn reproduces oppressive conditions and in institutions that cause distress leading to racial battle fatigue and a kind of psychological warfare. In historically white institutions, professional, in historical white um, professional context, racial battle fatigue can result in strained relations with white colleagues, experiencing constantly having one's credentials uh, questioned an unwieldy workload, job insecurity, lack of respect from white colleagues, and cultural, social, and professional alienation. 
Racial battle fatigue is taxing physically and emotionally for diverse faculty members. Academic labor and currency. In some cases, there are penalties and forfeitures when certain taxes are not paid. Academics, emotional and physical well-being is bound to be affected by decisions made about their lives in, in the academy. Stephen Ball discusses policy and higher education as influenced by the markets and managerialism. This performance is as follows. A culture and a mode of regulation that employs judgments, comparisons, and displays as means of incentive, control, attraction, and change based on rewards and sanctions, both material and symbolic. The performances serve as measures of productivity or output or displayed of uh, quality or moments of promotion or in inspection. As such, they stand for, encapsulate, or represent the worth, quality, or value of an individual within a field of judgment. The issue of who controls the field of judgment is crucial. And so and when we think about how members in your department are producing, I mean, um, how we, the language we use really should be um, examined. Right? The currency of academia is thusly commoditized by tenure and promotion systems, target settings, and output comparisons. These systems lead to um, security, ta seeking tactics, and existential anxiety, such as racial battle fatigue. It is important to consider that academic labor is not merely an essence of a thing. Academic labor is an articulation of active processes that normally go unspoken. Adriana Kieser concludes, the costs appear to outweigh the benefits. What does this mean for the leaders of these institutions? Well, that's the question of the day. Racial opportunity costs. Racial opportunity costs, or ROC, describes the price African-American and Latinx students pay to pursue educational success in a predominantly white school terrain. So racial battle fatigue, right, it, it, it impacts certainly your faculty in your department, but also the students you purport to serve in your department and the college writ large. Chambers at Law in 2014 write, racial opportunity cost diverges from its traditional application and that it can examine the costs to individual students of color as a result of the press of larger contextual factors. Although ROC describes the experiences of P12 students and K12 or, and higher ed students, ROC is effective um, at detailing the racialized experiences of other underrepresented groups due to the utility of its four assertions. And here they are. The first assertion is that the dominant society places expectations on students of color. And applying this to faculty of color in higher education, expectations often shift for those of color in academia, okay? The second assertion of ROC is the intersection of other identities for students that affect success. For instance, in chapter three of the book, Mildred Boveda reminds us that identities intersect and these intersections often become salient in academia's process, processes. The third assertion is that academic persistence in relationship to the institutional climates influence student success. For many faculty of color, this persistence often translates into extra work and overwork when other faculty are insulated from the same. As a department chair you know, uh, at Berea, we were recently looking at advising loads. And what I discovered was there was a white male professor who had very, 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 very few advisees, which would make sense because this particular professor's program has very few students. Whereas our Afri uh, African American faculty member had huge high loads for advising. Well, that would make sense because her program is flourishing. How, where's the, where's the equity in um, a, uh, a faculty member that, that doesn't have much advising and has all the time to write and be rewarded from the promotion and reward cycle with article after article and not have any advising responsibilities. Lastly, the fourth, lastly, the fourth assertion of ROC addresses the mental and emotional costs students of color pay when navigating a white-normed formal education system. In higher education, faculty of color endure mental and emotional costs in a white racial frame. The white racial frame mostly provides a context within which faculty of color must operate. 
The ROC construct can offer insight into standard operating procedures at the institutional college level and assist in examining how decision makers often function not as autonomous actors, but, but are primarily guided by the systematic, or rather the systemic influences of a larger context. The ROC construct provides the analytical lens to view the far too common experiences of faculty of color and indigenous faculty, a reminder of the difference between indigeneity and race and ethnicity. <clears throat> among other identity groups. The white racial frame. Scholars have postulated that faculty of color represented on campuses still operate within a hegemonic system of white supremacy that offers furtive and overt advantages to whites over people of color. Fagan in 2010 coined the idea of the white racial frame, which includes whiteness, white privilege, and institutionalized racism. The white racial frame perpetuates disproportionate power as whiteness has become common sense, which includes important racial stereotypes, understandings, images, and inclinations to act that prevail because whites have long had the power and the resources to impose this reality. This framing maintains systemic racism in, United States, in the United States and its institutions and among institutional agents. With the white racial frame as the norm, faculty of color often represented as disadvantaged in these institutions from the start. So in other words, if you're not retaining, if your department has faculty of color, they come and they go, they don't stay, whose narrative remains? That's why these counter narratives are important. <clears throat> credibility tax. The credibility tax has to do with the new knowledge faculty of color bring to the university and faculty themselves. Right? We should be viewing them as assets, not as deficits and liabilities. They have knowledge that makes our departments richer and more vibrant. Questions about these faculty may be, are they themselves seen as credible? And is what they have to share credible? In chapter one, Robin Ford reminds us of the minefield of tenure and promotion and what is and is not valuable in these categories depends very much on who is serving on the committees and what they value. So does your tenure and promotion guidelines for writing include op-eds, are those valued? You know, is an op-ed that's read by hundreds or even thousands of people valuable, whereas a peer-reviewed article is re read by 15 people? Like what, what, what scholarship has impact? What do you value? In universities, some forms of research are valued and celebrated more than others, especially research that conforms to dominant ideologies. For example, in chapter four of the book, Don Quigley discusses the resistance encountered in response to indigenous scholarship. Mental models of the dominant culture that justify systems and rules and educational research in such a way that make these models the standard for good research and complicates research by faculty of color. Um, regulate uh, research, right, this gold standard. Research intensive institutions like Ohio State, where Noel works, expect faculty members to seek out perceived top tier journals that privilege empirical, scientific, and quote unquote, air quotes, objective research. This coded language discursively calls qualitative research and scholarship on topics like race, ethnicity, and gender. Many scholars of color write on issues mirroring their own societal status. Publishing in quote unquote, objective journals is often untenable. Given white racial frames, the general perception is that minority-related topics do not constitute academic scholarship and that they are inappropriate and narrow in scope. Confounding the issue further, when faculty of color do publish and prefer top-tier journals, they can still ex experience racial separatism. In this case, the work of faculty of color are then considered outside of the mainstream for their professional and isolated uh, as unique but not standard for this field. Leading edge tax. Leading edge taxes are imposed on individuals when raising new inquiry and perspectives for groups not previously represented, such as feminism or faculty of color. Blazing new trails often creates certain inequities. While obvious to the faculty of color, marginality is often neither observable nor acknowledged by others within the academy. Faculty of color in particular are entrapped as they face extra scrutiny, stereotypes about their abilities, and expectations that they act nice 
in the wake of discrimination and adversity. Even though marginality is sometimes unobservable in a white racial frame, inequity remains obvious to faculty of color. In chapter one of the book, Robert Palmer, a leading scholar, notes that there are stereotypical assumptions about him and other black men simply because of the color of his skin. Faculty are told they can achieve the same rewards as their white colleagues if they adapt, try hard, harder, or take leading edge work and make it more mainstream. Faculty of color, such as Sayo Camacho in chapter five of the book, are told to be flexible and adaptive while white colleagues may even be explicitly told institutional practices should accommodate them. Leading edge work can often come with inequitable material realities like inequity in pay and other rewards, such as holding leadership positions, holding an endowed chair or distinguished professorship. In chapter five, Martel Pipkins, uh, and, and I wanna, after I read this, make an aside about Martel's chapter. In chapter five, Martel discusses his time in an adjunct uh, position, empty of health benefits, job security, departmental influence, visibility, certain department, university opportunities in the form of professional development and a pay cut that would repress, repress his ability um, to remain fed and housed. These inequities constitute another form of racial microaggressions that reinforce a type of economic or opportunity ceiling for faculty of color. Many of the scholars um, are respected in their fields who contributed chapters. But one theme, and I apologize to them all, sincerely, was that writing about it for some was racial battle fatigue. I'll give you an example of why. One, one person, the publisher says, you know, I think your title, you, you, you probably shouldn't use that, in, that word in your title. Okay. The feedback that we gave to some of the storytellers in the, the chapters, that was racial battle fatigue for some of them because they said, this is my voice. I want it written this way. Who has the power to, to edit that? The publisher is like, well, we will, we'll publish the book still, even though you have a contract, but you should be aware that when people search the term fill in the blank, that might not look good. There's a narrowing, a censorship, a, a restriction of, of their truth in the publication process. Have you heard of the term sensitivity readers? The idea that publishers have people read the book as if it might be too offensive to someone? I don't know how to really capture the idea that we have to water down and censor people's lived experience. It's a sanitization of, of racism. Tierney and Ben Simone, group, group status tax. Tierney and Ben Simone in 1996 described the price faculty are willing to pay in order to be accepted. Their term smile work aptly describes how marginalized faculty try to navigate institutional patterns in academia. Being nice is a pervasive mediator for faculty of color and professional communities, demonstrating how professional taxes intersect along lines of race and gender. In chapter one, Cleveland Hayes reminds us that colleges are often spaces that uphold and maintain white supremacy. Niceness, niceness is problematic and it creates a pitfall for those of color. The persistence of niceness as a discourse functions as a gendered and race mental habit that remains firmly entrenched. It is a recurring frame through which whiteness is normalized, constituting a tenuous sense of belonging and rightful presence. In chapter two, Andrew Cho and Sopeng Men discuss how prolonged silence in the institution is often stereotyped as being timid or indicative of the quiet Asian male stereotype. These silences are often another way that white, the white voice is reaffirmed and upheld and other voices subsumed in larger discourse. Cho and Pang encourage the full support of upper administration to counter these silences. So my, my perspective is that department chairs, who is speaking up during department chairs, you know, 
the whole WAIT acronym, W-A-I-T, why am I, te why am I talking? You know, is there equity in terms of a voice? There are strategies you can use to ensure that faculty of color, their voices are heard. Use a talking piece. You can only talk if you have this talisman. Have a speaker sheet. There are many strategies. Um, we're getting, I wanna save enough time at the end for, for the dialogue, so I will wrap this up here. Group taxes can also come in the form of professional station or regard or place in an organization. Group tax is a result of processes and practices. Places and spaces hold certain norms, mores, formal and informal ways of operating that material and subjectively influence certain individuals from the sense of being to the entitlements they receive. In chapter two, Anita Chicago reminds us that many in the white environment often reify the whiteness of the space. To counter racial battle fatigue, Chicago proposes developing networks in which people understand that academia is racialized, gendered, and a class space. The social geographies of a group affect them and manipulate one's sense of position and behavior in an environment. Changes in expected po positioning <clears throat> in a form of being out of place. Potentially viewed as out of place, or out of their expected position, faculty of color can experience aspects of racial battle fatigue by feeling isolated, feared, unheard, outnumbered, and or feeling an out of placeness. In chapter two of the book, Sato discusses being ignored, pacified, and deflected. You know, as chairs, you have so many things coming at you from so many different angles, and things can easily get lost. But something as small as an unreturned email can cause great alarm for faculty of color. So before we transition, um, I'd like to just share a, an example of where I did something bad as a department chair that probably caused anxiety. Well, I know it did. The dean asked me to um, give him a response to a question. I'll just say that, a question. And so I forwarded that message to the two parties, the two professors, and I simply said, hey, professor one, hey, professor two, please send me a copy of your CV and let's schedule a time to meet. Those two faculty, one was on tenure, non-tenure track, year to year, and the other was pre-tenure. Well, I learned that that caused them a lot of stress because they were thinking that the dean was really thinking about um, their performance, when that couldn't be farther from the truth. The, the actual um, intent for me to meet with them was to hear about their great work and so I could brag about their great work and really make a, a, a really good argument for all, all their good work and why they're valuable to the institution. And so little things like that, if, if I knew that would have happened, I wouldn't have sent that. It was, you know, we're so busy, right? Department chairs, you're, you're, I don't know, you're teaching, we're, we're strapped, right? And so those little things of an unanswered email or an email answered incorrectly can cause a lot of anxiety for our faculty of color, indigenous faculty, minoritized um, faculty. So with that being said, at your table group, <clears throat> I have some questions I'd like you to discuss. Given how I defined racial battle fatigue, this is a, I'll, I'll start from the easy to, to harder. So let's start with question one. Talk in your groups. Have you ever experienced racial battle fatigue? 